Hey, good morning, Family Life Church. We're back with a week three of What Does the Bible Say? Got a few more rapid responses for you guys. David, are you ready to kick this off? Dude, let's do it. All right, let's rock on. So the very first one is, how do we know what God's calling or purpose in our life? How do we figure that out? That's a great question. Someone asked, um, it's one that a lot of people think about, um, and it's really a too big of an answer to talk about in a minute. Um, my suggestion would be to go to the website. The church website is Ocala FLC, like Ocala Family Life Church, dot com. And on there, there's a resource page, and you'll find a series called Divine Direction. And listen to that series. It's four weeks, and we tackle that exact subject. Awesome. Next question, one that I've heard over all these years, is what is the unforgivable sin? So what does the Bible say about the unforgivable sin? Very good question. Now I remember as a kid being scared when I heard about this because I was afraid I did it and I couldn't go to heaven now, you know. Um, and let me do this as a quick answer. If you're worried about it, you haven't done it. Um, and we see this in Mark 3 where Jesus t- talks about there being an unforgivable sin, which is cursing the Holy Spirit or speaking blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it really came about in a story where the Pharisees, these religious leaders of the day, um, got to witness Jesus um, doing these miracles. I mean, you got the word of God, you know, you got it right in front of them. And after all these miracles, they <laughs> called Jesus the devil pretty much. And so Jesus turned around and said, you know, when you speak against me, it can be forgiven. But when you speak against the Holy Spirit, it can't be forgiven. And so it's not a single act. It's more of an ongoing attitude of rejection of God, even when you know the truth. Man, uh, great, great answer to that one. Uh, next one is, uh, what should our attitude be toward drinking alcohol? Mm. Another really, really good question. It's a big topic in a lot of Christian groups, especially if you grew up in a conservative household where um, alcohol was pretty much the devil's drink, right? And um, so in in the Bible, if you look at a biblical premise, is it okay to drink? Yes. It actually says Jesus drank. Um, and uh, But we got to be careful with how we do it because there is a biblical premise that if you get drunk, that's a sin. And then the real big problem is once you drink, start drinking and, and you get drunk, you start committing other sins. Um, and so I think that we have to look at the wisdom also of Paul. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, he talks about how, um, he, he writes about how we can, even though we can do things legally, you know, through God's law, doesn't mean that we should. And so we have to ask ourselves, okay, maybe it's okay for us to drink, but is it wise? And so I think we also have to look at our situation. Are we going out drinking in a place where we could do others harm? Like you're going to go drink a whole bunch and drive home? That's not wise. And we also got to ask ourselves, who are we drinking with? Are we going out with buddies who like to push us to drink more? You know, that might be a problem. You know, if you're going out on a bachelor party with some of your Christian friends that you trust and um, you guys just want to have a beer with your your dinner, no problem. If you're going out on a bachelor party with guys who like to party it up um, and, you know, tend to take it a little bit too far, um, yeah, you probably should use wisdom and probably abstain in that situation. Right. Uh, last one is how do we understand the gifts of God or mm-hmm. our gifting and what the Lord's given us? Yeah, so the gifts of God is a very interesting subject. It's, uh, we've seen three places in the New Testament where it talks about how God gives people gifts. And these tend to be played out through your personalities. And uh, there's a great resource called giftstest.com that I encourage anyone to go to who's curious about this. But the important thing to understand is that these gifts are meant to bring glory to God. And God gives them to us to build his kingdom here on earth through the church. And so we like to say um, that uh, when we serve, we use and we honor God through our gifts. Awesome. Well, thanks, David. Well, uh, next week we're going to be wrapping up what does the Bible say. So uh, we look forward to next time. I am fully committed to his plan for my life, and I submit to his leadership and authority over me. Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit goes before me and leads my steps. I do not belong to myself. I belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords. By his hand of mercy, I now stand and walk in his life. I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and am a child of the living God. Amen. Amen.
Today we're going to be continuing in this uh, series, What Does the Bible Say About? And today we're going to be talking about marriage and divorce. Pretty heavy duty stuff in um, many situations. Uh, we pray that God would just give us grace to speak from his heart on this. Uh, I want to share with you a quote. This is from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, uh, almost bigger than life in World War II. Um, he's one, let me see if I can remember this. He said something to the effect of, um, I, uh, all I can promise you is uh, blood, sweat, and tears, something like this, uh, in terms of dealing with the Germans. And he brought Britain through the assault by the Nazis. And so, Winston Churchill, a phenomenal historical figure, but listen to this. This is from his quote. My most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. Now, he carried Britain all the way through World War II. He said, piece of cake. Boy, I didn't really say that. But getting this lady to marry me that was when I was really shy. Uh, how many of you heard of the Methodist Church? Not everybody's heard of the Methodist Church. Uh, the Wesley Brothers started the Methodist Church. John Wesley, uh, one of the founders, and uh, he had an unhappy marriage of 15 years. And when she left him after 15 years, what did he do? Nothing. Uh, looking at situations in our families, in our lives, uh, what I want to share with you is four items to consider in, in the arena of divorce. And uh, the first one is if uh, in a marriage relationship, if, if one of the partners, um, listen to this, is an unrepentant adulterer. If they are involved with another person outside of marriage bonds sexually and they seem to be pleased with it, there are no signs that they're stopping it, uh, you do not need to stay in that situation. God does not require you to tolerate that behavior. Now, if it was a one-time situation where things got out of hand, and afterwards, they're filled with remorse and regret, and they're repenting. They're saying, listen, I, I don't want to be a part of whatever that was. I, I, I love my spouse, and I want to stay in this marriage. Then we, we need to respect the fact that, that none of us are perfect. But uh, when the person is unrepentant, that is not something that you should be expected to stay a part of. That's number one. Number two is domestic abuse. Now, most of the time, this is where the husband is beating on the wife and physically attacking her. A woman should never stay in a physically abusive marriage. Now, let that sink in for a minute. The wife needs to get her and the children out of the house if her husband is beating her or making violent threats. And it's irresponsible for any Christian minister to tell an abused woman to stay in a situation that is physically dangerous. Uh, that's number two. Number three is a, a little, little bit different here, but it's emotional cruelty or control. There's times where women have endured years of verbal abuse from husbands who claim sometimes to love God, but don't understand that their dominating attitudes are slowly killing their wives. Some husbands think they have the right to monitor and analyze their wives' every move. Uh, they scold their wives. They scream at them or subject them to constant profanity and angry tirades. What is the fruit of that? Listen to this. This can lead to depression, addiction, and even suicide. And if that spouse is not repentant to turn away from that type of thing, then uh, maybe you need to look for other options, a.k.a. divorce. But this pr principle also applies, listen to this, to spouses who are involved in drug abuse, alcoholism, 
or criminal activity. You realize that you could be arrested for something your spouse is doing as an accessory to the crime? So uh, consider that. And then the last one is spiritual incompatibility. And uh, Scripture tells us in Corinthians that when you come to Jesus and your spouse, well, let, let, let's, let's come from this approach. Let's say that you, you come to Jesus, you give your heart to the Lord, and your spouse says, well, listen, I'm not necessarily going to buy into this idea that, you know, you, at the church thing, you, you, you go ahead to church and if you want to take the kids, that's fine, but I don't really want to have anything to do with it. Scripture says, if that's the case, stay with the unbelieving partner. But that unbelieving partner says, you did what? What do you mean you're saved? What do we mean that you're serving God now? What, 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 what? I don't want none of this. I'm done. Scripture actually says, to let them go. How about that? The unbelieving partner that says, I don't want any part of it, and they want to leave, Scripture says, let them go. Wow. Um, let me share a Scripture with you. 1 Corinthians 7, 28. This is fun. Those who marry will have tons of fun. They will think they're living in Disney World 24-7. Do you have a different version of mine? That's not what it says. <laughs> Those who marry will have trouble in this life. I want you to be, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> uh, you know, to be frank with you, I have never been to a marriage ceremony where the, the uh, officiant, the pastor, whatever, says, our dearly beloved, we're gathered here to join this couple to trouble. <laughs> they have agreed to enter into trouble together. Bless their hearts. You know? uh, but that's... <laughs> uh, those who marry will have trouble in this life. And uh, marriage... Somebody said this. Uh, marriage is the inevitable joining of the husband who can't sleep with the window down with the wife who can't sleep with the window up. How do you reconcile that? You know, the house with no windows? You know, uh, the, ad, the, the adjustments that come with two people in a marriage that sometimes, sometimes can be quite staggering. So how, how do we um, kind of reconcile this? Now, let me tell you what the world says. This is the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world says just move in together and live like husband and wife. And uh, then you'll find out, you know, the window stuff, you'll find out stuff you'll never find out any other way. And uh, you'll, after, you know, a year or two, you'll say, okay, yeah, we're compatible, we'll get married. Or, yeah, we're not going to do this. That's the world. That's not what God says. Uh, researchers have concluded that couples who live together before they tie the knot saw a 33% higher rate of divorce than those who waited to live together until after they were married. That's not the answer. Now, let me give you some upsides here. The U.S. divorce rate dropped for the third year in a row, reaching its lowest point in nearly 40 years, according to data that was released this past November. Okay? We have a video we'd like to show to you. My name is Danny Campbell, and this is my wife, Janelle Campbell. And we met in uh, Brooklyn, New York, because we live next door to each other, across the street. And the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my name is Mark Hertzstein. This is my wife, Sandy. Yes, and we met as she waitressed at Big Boys, bringing me my breakfast. Number my number, my number eight. That's right. That's right. Eggs, toast, and hash browns. I think the struggle would always be finances, um, like it is in, in probably a great majority of people in their marriages. Is, is no, never having enough. And I think if there's any issue we ever had was me not understanding why we don't have enough. And but she would be the 
the bookkeeper and explain it to me and, and uh, they always worked out. Yeah. God always provided. Being two individuals entering into a marriage, sometimes, you know, it's a struggle um, listening to that other individual in that marriage. So um, just so long as you can recognize that and come back and realize that, you know, um, you need to respect that other person's um, views, then I think you'll be fine. Uh, I follow up whatever she says right now. <laughs> People say, I'd like to find someone that will fulfill me. Okay? Conversely, uh, somebody get married and say, well, they're not really fulfilling me. Uh, let, let me say this. Don't look to your spouse to fulfill you. Only Jesus can do that. Only walking by the Holy Spirit can do that. Just think about what you're putting, what you're dumping on your spouse when you're wanting them to fulfill you. Jesus is the only one that does that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. He says, Now I will discuss the things you wrote me about. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because sexual sin is a danger. Whoa. Did you see that? Because sexual sin is a danger. Each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Sexual sin is a danger. Uh, think about danger for a moment. You know, when you've got a little guy who walks around the house, we put these little covers over the electrical receptacle because they're dangerous. We don't leave them unexposed and give them a little paper clips and have fun, buddy. <laughs> we can get a little charge on this. You know, we don't do that. Why? Because it's danger. Uh, my wife thinks that every snake on the earth is after her. She thinks that they all have this genetic code that when they see her, they say, that's what we've been looking for, let's get her. <laughs> well, my, my, my father-in-law, um, big time fisherman, and fish love little snakes. And so a lot of lures replicate snakes. And um, he gave all my boys a little snake-looking lure. They brought it home and terrorized their mom. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of kids we raised. <laughs> Somehow they got a hold of uh, these rubber snakes, and uh, she was ready to move to Georgia just to get away from these boys and their snake stuff. <laughs> and um, so I took it away from her, and I thought, you know, there might be some good use for this. Place. So I, I went in one of my drawers, and, and I put them under a bunch of clothes, and I was confident the boys would never find it. We're good to go. Guess who does the laundry in our house? <laughs> the whole neighborhood heard her scrap when she went to that drawer and there was a snake. <laughs> Danger. But yet, in our society, we treat sex, and we're talking about sexual sin, as if it's something to just have fun with and explore. Well, sexual activity outside of marriage invites unpleasant developments in our lives. That's where the danger comes in. God designed us as sexual beings, and it's in the confines of marriage that sex carries God's blessing. Verse 3, the husband, listen to this, should give his wife all that he owes her as his wife. And the wife should give her husband all that she owes him as her husband. You see that word, owes? Do you realize that when you go into a marriage, that word, owes, comes into place? Yeah. Verse 4. The wife does not have full rights over her own body. 
Boy, the world hates them. Her husband shares them. Look at this. And the husband does not have full rights over his own body. His wife shares them. Marriage is for sharing. Verse 5. Do not refuse to give your bodies to each other unless, here's the caveat, unless you both agree to stay away from sexual relations for a time so you can keep your time to prayer. Then come together again. So, look at this. Do you realize that Satan wants to disrupt everything? Every blessing, every good thing that God has for you and I, Satan wants to disrupt it. You think about that. I heard somebody say, matter of fact, it was a, a young lady that she was an All-American with Louisiana State University playing soccer. And uh, I heard her share her testimony recently on a program on television. But, but she shared this thought. She said, before a couple gets married, Satan does everything he can to get them involved sexually. Satan throws everything he can trying to get them involved sexually before marriage. But then after they marry, he does everything he can to keep them from sexual involvement. Satan has nothing good for you and I. Now listen to this. Without sexual intimacy, a marriage becomes only two roommates that are sharing a house together. That's not God's design. Unless this is mutually agreed upon, that would be against God's design. And it will invite things that you don't want. Uh, verse 9, let's continue. It says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. It is better to marry than to burn with sexual desire. When one spouse simply quits on the other sexually, they are exposing their partner to temptations that are greater than God's design intends. We have another video we have to share. Hands down, compromise. <laughs> <laughs> compromise. You know, when you have, you're in a relationship, with, and two people are there with strong personalities and, and having, wanting to have their ways, it's, it compromises is, is the key thing to being able to, to, to move forward and, and to have a, a successful relationship. Yes, I agree. And just loving and respecting each other, I think that's important yeah. to a successful marriage. Yeah. I think personally the key to a successful marriage would be realize that it's not all about yourself. It's exactly. about that other person. Right. Agree? 100% put the other person first and... Yes, I believe so too. Even though in the Bible it talks about how a man uh, is, you know, the, in a sense is the head of the home, but he also, I, I, I always believe that the wife ought to be part of it. And so when it comes to decision making, I want her to help me with the decisions because she brings wisdom into the marriage that I don't have. And uh, so I've always appreciated that. And we've always done that. Yeah. Plus, if I fall, if we fail, then she's it's part of the failure, you. too. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Let the blame be spread around evenly. <laughs> uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands... Look at this, gentlemen. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it to make it belong to God. So husbands, there's the standard. Love your wives just like Christ loved the church. Let me share something with you. Christ sacrificed himself for the church. So gentlemen, there's your standard right there. The measure that we men should use and how we should love our wives is by looking at how much Jesus loves the church. Husbands, how much are you sacrificing yourself for? How much are you sacrificing yourself? Uh, let me share a little personal thing that I have practiced. Um, my father-in-law has passed on. 
He's, he's with the Lord now. And I'm looking forward to the day that I can see him again. And you know what I want to hear him say? I want to hear him say that you were the best thing that could have happened to my daughter. Gentlemen, when you marry that wife, she's another man's daughter. Are you treating her the way that her daddy would want you to treat her? Are you giving her the due deference that he would be delighted with? I want to hear my father-in-law say, you're the best thing that could have happened to her. And so I want my actions to match that. Of course, I'm going to see Jesus. And my wife is a daughter of the King. Amen. And I want my Heavenly Father to say, you did my daughter well. You treated my daughter just the way I would want her treated. Verse 28, husbands should love their wives. Look at this. As they love their own bodies. You see, self-serving love will strangle the best of relationships. Verse 33, a wife must respect her husband. A wife's disrespect of her husband will destroy a husband's confidence and vision for the future. I've got three things here that, that these three things spouses need to have operating in their marriage. The first thing is patience. Do you realize that our culture does not promote patience? Our culture promotes rush, rush, hurry, hurry, quick, let's get this thing moving down the road. Is there's just not a lot of patience. And there's a pushiness that tends to be a part of our culture. And we need to let that go and exercise some patience. Gentlemen, it's so easy to say something that you wish you'd never said. Ladies, ditto. A little bit of patience. You know, your wife will do things that make you angry, will make you irritated. Your spouse, it goes both ways. And for us to hold our tongue, being patient, we need to add that to the venue for our marriage. The next thing is love. The scripture says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life. So, that kind of love is what God has called us to in our marriage. And then the third thing we need to bring to marriage is respect. Now listen to this. Respect will cause you to hold your tongue. Words do hurt. <coughs> Words cut. They damage to the point of no return. Let the grace of God teach you to hold your tongue. These three things have the power to bring a sense of permanence to the marriage relationship. We have one more video we'd like to share with you. Personally, I, I think, you know, when I think of, and, and I think, believe it's 1 Corinthians, talks about how uh, a woman brings holiness into a marriage. And I think I have to treat her as something, realizing that God is within her. And, and so my wife is, is Jesus Christ living in my wife. And how would you not love Jesus Christ in your wife? And, and so I've tried to do that and tried to treat her as something more than just a wife, but a holy person. Well, faith has impacted uh, our marriage in a, in a very positive way. My wife started coming to the church first, and she's getting involved, and I, you know, I saw how, how happy it made her, and, and the kids, and the kids loved it as well, and for me, it was, I felt left out, so therefore I said, okay, let me come in and see what it is that you know, is making them, drawing them to, this, to church. You know, every, Sunday. every single <laughs> Sunday, religiously, and then being happy about it. And when I came, I it was I was just blown away by the the, the 
the environment and the people and also you know beginning that new connection to God and it, it strengthened my faith and made me become wanted to be here closer with him and that's why Rick brought me here today you know today and every single Sunday that I come here and that strengthens me I think it's important as women and as wives that we want our families to be involved in the church and that was very important to me and um, even though my husband didn't attend when I first attended, I decided, you know what, I'll lead by example and I would just let him come in his own time. So that's what I did and he saw the impact it had on me and our kids and that's when he decided to join. So sometimes we have to meet our spouses in their own time and their own space and just lead by example, believe in God and things will happen. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Right where you're at, just in the solemnity of your own heart. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to lives this morning. Listen to what God is saying. And you've heard, you've been prompted by the Spirit of God that there needs to be some changes. I want you right now to commit to do what God is telling you. Whatever it is the Holy Spirit is whispering to your heart, I want you to commit to that. And say, well, God, with your grace and your anointing, I'm going to do what you're speaking to my heart about. Let's give me some changes. By your grace, God, these changes are going to happen. Right there, make this a solemn moment before God. Just commit yourself to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is directing you. Everybody with their eyes closed. You may be here this morning and you'd say, well, Pastor Charles, I, I've never really surrendered my life to God, but I really feel like I need to do that. Let me tell you what you need to do. If you feel God and His call on your life and you've never surrendered to Him and you want to do that right now, in your heart, say, God listens to a sincere heart. In your heart, all you have to do is say, God, right now, I, I just ask you to come into my heart. Lord God, I, I, I don't want to be the, the captain of my ship anymore. Lord, I want you to take over my life. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe you rose again on the third day. And right now, I just want to surrender my life to you, that you would be glorified through me. God, I want to belong to you. Right now, in the quietness of your heart, do that. Jesus, I just want to give myself to you entirely. Nothing reserved. I want everything that my life represents in the future to be for you. If you'll do that right now, Scripture says that he'll come in to you. And he'll be your Lord and your Savior. Jesus. We're so thankful to you. We're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for, for, for the presence of your spirit. We're thankful for your call of oh God and how you seek to, to direct us into that path that brings true life. Lamb of God, and, and as people are responding to the wooing of your spirit and as people are res responding to that sense of direction that you're giving out to those who are seeking you, Lamb of God, we ask for a fresh anointing. We ask for a fresh outpouring of your grace into our hearts that we can step up, oh God, and enter into that place that you're calling us to. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, oh God, for hearing our call to you. For it is in the mighty and the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.